were the major day-to-day -day features of that golden age in the relationships between the Jewish community and the Muslim communities and Muslim authorities? So what, what we need to understand is background information is that in Islamic law, there's an idea of dimitude, which is, you know, when the Muslims who rapidly expand during this period of time, but the first, you know, Muhammad, uh, he's, he's, his death is in 632, and Islam in the next 150 years is going to expand very rapidly, absorbing the entire Middle East and North Africa and getting across to Spain, and it takes another 700 years to get out to, you know, the Far East, to the largest Muslim nation in the world today, which is Indonesia. And it's also an important background to understand that while most Arabs are Muslims, most Muslims aren't Arabs. Very important feature. We kind of conflate the two together, but there are actually, you know, there's 22 states of the Arab League, but there's, I think, 56 countries that have Islam as their religion, and the largest Islamic countries in the world are not Arab. Indonesia and India, which is Hindu, has the second largest, uh, you know, Muslim population with a minority of 400 million people. Um, but in Dimi law, as Islam expands, it's absorbing lots of non-Muslims, because Islam behaves not just as a religion, but also as an empire. And they literally physically absorb into their expanding sphere different Islamic dynasties, many other countries and peoples and faiths. And Islam, which is a legalistic religion, uh, basically defines two groups of people. Pagans uh, have no future in Islam. They, they cannot, you can't practice paganism. You have to convert, become a slave, or die. But Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M -I, is a very interesting thing that most people aren't aware of, which is still really part of Islamic worldview and Islamic law is non-Muslim monotheists, primarily Jews and Christians, but also Zoroastrians. Because you believe in one God, Islam says, we allow you to practice your faith, but you're basically a second-class citizen. You have to wear a special sign or a badge to distinguish you as being different. You have to pay a special tax, a very heavy poll tax called the jizya. You can't testify in court against Muslims. You can't employ them as servants. You have to step into the gutter when they're walking on the sidewalk. You can't ride an animal and be higher. If your synagogue or church is allowed to be built, it has to be subterranean or semi-subterranean to show its inferiority to Islam. It's really like Islamic apartheid. The unique facet of oh, the Umayyad dynasty is that they chose not to adhere to Islamic law strictly. And therefore, they allowed, because when the Muslims conquer Spain, the Jews actually follow into, the, follow into Spain with them. Before that, Spain was, you know, was... Um, Visigoth, it was Germanic peoples who would, who would actually settled in Spain and became very oppressive of, of, of Jews, especially. So the Jews welcomed uh, the arrival of Islam, which at the time, as, as opposed to today, was very enlightened and open. And therefore, I mean, that's a very long-winded answer to get to a question you're asking, is a unique feature of this period of time was that the Umayyad dynasty, which is basically the Caliph of Cordoba in Spain, primarily focused on the city of Cordoba, was allowed Jews and Christians to basically do their stuff freely and openly. And Jews were therefore allowed pretty much to ascend to whatever level of success that they wanted to, whatever field they wanted to, combined with the fact that unlike today where the Islamic world has kind of closed and reactionary, it's another interesting feature of what's happened is the Islamic world was far more enlightened, at least parts of it, a thousand years ago than it is today. Unlike the Christian world, which was much more closed a thousand years ago and is not even, is not only more enlightened, but is really not really Christian. Europe is only minimally, you know, veneer Christian. So Islam was very open and progressive and made many great strides in science and philosophy and mathematics and medicine. It's a whole huge topic we should probably go into more. And Jews played a major role in that, contributing to that. And a kind of a similar vision of what Jews did in the Enlightenment in Europe when they were finally emancipated. But in this case, it's unique in that it wasn't done in such a secular way. So you had a really amazing symbiotic relationship at this period of time, which I do not believe has ever been duplicated at any period of time in the last 2,000 years of Jews living amongst non-Jews. 